Heavenly Father, we worship you, we praise you. We're grateful that we have our Lord Jesus Christ, our solid rock. And we stand this morning on Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer. And we ask your blessings on us as we come now to the preaching of the word. Father, help me. Give me strength. Help me to be faithful to you. Speak through me to us as a church. Use this passage from Matthew 7 to give us a greater confidence on Christ, our solid rock. That we will trust him, rely on him. And I pray for those who are here who do not know him yet. That they will come to know him. That he will come to know the Lord. That she will come to know the Lord. Father, speak to them. Help us also to be doers of the word. Not only listeners of the word, but also doers of the word. Bless us. Be with us. Shape us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you're visiting with us, welcome. It is great to have you with us. Uh, we believe in the centrality of the Bible. We believe that God uses the word of the Bible, or the word of God, to speak to us, to transform us, to change us, to sustain us. So we have been walking the last few months uh, through the sermon, sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And today we come to the end of that Sermon on the Mount. Today is the last sermon on the series on the Sermon on the Mount. And next Sunday, we'll begin a new series on Christmas. Uh, we will look at the Old Testament as the advent of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ next week from the book of Isaiah. So we'll be walking through the book of Isaiah the next two weeks and then the passage of the birth of the Lord Jesus on, Christ, uh, on Christmas Eve uh, of that Sunday. So excited to be on that series. But also excited about concluding this series and beginning the next year, Matthew 8 and 9, as we see the power of the Lord Jesus Christ as we keep walking through the book of Matthew for the next few months. So if you have a Bible, please go to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. If you're new with us, you don't know much about the Bible, you don't have a Bible, you can take one of those Bibles in front of you and you don't know where Matthew 7 is, you will find Matthew 7 in, the, in page 812 on the, Pew's Bible, on the Pew Bibles. So, but also, Matthew 7, when I say 7, I mean the chapter in the book, the large number. And verses are the small numbers. So today we'll read chapter 7 in the book of Matthew, verses 24 through 29. Matthew 7, 24 through 29. So let's stand together as we read the word of God. Matthew 7, verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. Verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. You may be seated. This is the word of God. So when we read a passage, normally I will give you one sentence give you, to give you what is the teaching, the idea, the main thought that this passage is communicating. So this is the main thought that these verses are communicating to us. A wise person does the words of Jesus and builds his life on Jesus. A wise person does the words of Jesus and builds his life on Jesus. That is the main message that these uh, verses are communicating. 
I mean, this is the end of the sermon. It is interesting that Christ is concluding the sermon not with an exciting, beautiful story, but with a convicting one where the one who is not listening to him and doing his words will be crushed. And this is the context here. So Jesus is telling us to build our life on him. Everyone is building a house. That is a life, a career, a family, a name, or wealth. And everyone is building a house on some foundation. We all have a source of authority that informs and shapes what we do. We call that a worldview, kind of the lenses through which we see everything. And we will try to build something on something that we believe is true and stable. So Jesus is inviting here us to believe that his word is the most stable and only secure foundation in the whole universe. Only the word of God, only the word of God can be that secure foundation. This parable here describes two ways to live. And we will have to make a decision. One decision will lead us to flourishing and the other one will lead us to destruction. The one who builds on Christ is called wise. My friend Danny Akin, who uh, wrote a book on the Sermon on the Mount, he defines wise this way, and I quote him. Wisdom is the ability to see life from God's perspective and to do then and to then act accordingly. Wisdom is the ability to see life from God's perspective and to then act accordingly. That is wisdom here in this context. To hear the words of Jesus and then to practice the words of Jesus. And that is the point that this passage is communicating. So with that background or foundation, I have three points that I want to draw as we walk through these verses. These are the three. The first one, disciples of Christ hear and do the word of Christ. Put the Bible into practice. Disciples of Christ hear and do the word of Christ and put the Bible into practice. That's the first point. Read with me in verse 24. He says, everyone who then hears these words of mine and does them and practice them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. That person, he said, and then he says in 25, the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. He said, that person who builds his house on this rock, by doing my words, that will be wise. So he's inviting us to do that. The, the story is encouraging us to put into practice the words of Jesus. This is what discipleship means. The whole book of Matthew, disciples are those who follow Jesus, who imitate Jesus, and those who practice what Jesus teaches. They put Jesus' words into practice. A wise person hears the words of Jesus and puts them into practice. And that is precisely the point that James makes in James 1. James was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus. And you could argue that the book of James is almost like a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. In James 1, verses 22, 25, he says this. But brothers... Sisters, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once, and once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law the law of liberty, and perseveres, being not hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed 
in his doing. Basically, don't just be an expectator, someone who's just watching and not doing anything. I will tell you, to listen to sermons and not to put them into practice is very dangerous. There are people who listen to sermons, they do a lot of Bible studies, they watch sermons online, and nothing. This passage is telling us, very dangerous. Be careful. I, growing up, small town, Dominican Republic, I used to go to a barber shop. Sometimes I needed a haircut, sometimes I did not. But I would go because I learned that if I wanted to know what was happening in the town, I'd just go to the barber shop. So I go to the barber shop, and those guys, they were, they were experts at sports and politics. I will tell you, they knew everything about baseball and basketball. But they also knew everything about public policy. I mean, I said, they could be running the country. They know everything and all the solutions to the problems. I was amazed at them as I was a little one, boy. But then as I grew, I learned that they actually did not know anything. <laughs> I mean, they would give you the answer for everything. If we have asked them today who's going to be in the championship, they would tell you that Michigan, Washington, Florida State, and Texas will be in the championship. I know I lost those from Alabama and Georgia there. <laughs> but they would tell you the answers. They had opinions about everything. But this is what was the problem with them. They were never running for office. They never had a position. They were just talking about politics. They never played sports. They would just talk about sports. They knew more basketball than LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, or Michael Jordan. But they didn't know how to shoot the ball. Because they were just listeners. They would watch sports, but they would not play the sport. They would be watching from the outside, but not on the ground, not on the field. And Jesus is basically saying, you have been listening to me. Now go and put it into practice. Because if you are just listening to the sermon, just reading the Bible, but the Bible is not transforming and changing you, you are foolish. The word, the word in the Greek for foolish here is the word moros, which the one we use for moron. Honestly, it is. So you are a moron, an idiot, if you listen and do not do anything. That is the plain Greek, honestly. And, and that's what's going on here. So some people, he says, will be informed by the words of Jesus, but they will not be transformed by the words of Jesus. And through disciples, wise people will be informed by the words of Jesus, but they will also be transformed by the words of Jesus. Sinclair Ferguson puts it this way. Jesus did not preach the Sermon on the Mount in order to be admired for his homiletical skills. He preached it to produce obedience. Jesus did not preach the Sermon on the Mount in order to be admired for his hom homiletical skills. He preached it to produce obedience. The house that is destroyed is the life of the person who finds the words of Jesus important enough to listen to them, but not important enough to put them into practice. For that person, the words of Jesus are practical to be amazed, but not practical enough for real life. Or perhaps they are too spiritual. Or perhaps they are too hard. Regardless of the reason, this person, the foolish one, listens 
but does not put them into practice. And I will tell you, a superficial, casual Christianity might make you look good here, but it will not protect you from the day of judgment. And I say that with love and grace. Because the Bible is telling us that. We need to be doers of the word. When I'm teaching in seminary or in college, I tell my students, I say, if you study theology and you study the Bible, and the study of theology makes you more arrogant and mean with people, there's something wrong with your theology or with your heart. Change either your theology or repent. I mean, I don't know if you have observed, but sometimes the people who read the Bible the most are the most arrogant and mean people, which does, does not make sense. If we are being transformed by Jesus, if we're reading the Bible, it should make us more like Jesus. But we have to put into practice. There are people say, I want to read this. I want to read theology. I want to read all these books. And they're doing five Bible studies during the week. But they're not being changed or transformed. So Christ is warning us against that. That can become a form of idolatry. Where we are amazed at Jesus. But we walk away not transformed by him. And I will tell you, when we read the Bible, the Bible is reading us. When we jump into the story of God and the revelation of God, that word from God will change us, transform us, mold us, change us, shape us into the image of Christ. So brothers and sisters, as we read the words of Jesus, as we listen to the words of Jesus, we need to be transformed by those words. We need to become more like Christ. Number two, be wise and build your life on the secure foundation of the word of God. Be wise and build your life on the secure foundation of the word of God. Read with me now verses 26 and 27. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house. And it fell. And great was the fall of it. You know, in society, there's an expression that people use, young people more normally would use it, it's built different. And so the idea is, and I have a kind of an image here kind of to capture the image, like I'm just built different. And the idea is like you are extremely talented, able to do what others cannot do. And people say, I'm built different. Uh, when you're playing basketball, like Kobe Bryant was built different. I mean, he, was, he had a broken arm and he would keep playing basketball. Because he was better than the rest. He wouldn't do what others would not. There's a toughness that comes with that. The Bible says that it is not us being different. It is about the foundation in which we have been built. If you see the two houses, they're pretty much the same. They look the same. But the strength is not in the house per se. The strength is on the foundation, on the rock. And that rock is Jesus. So we could assume 
that the two houses here are in the same subdivision, in the same neighborhood, in the same city, because the same storm is affecting both of them. We could speculate that the one that was built on sand was more beautiful because they maybe had more resources that they didn't put into the foundation that they could put into, I don't know, more windows or something like that. So people walking by will see the two houses and they will look the same. Oh, those are two houses. That is true of a Christian and a non-Christian. If you walk by them and just look at them, so just two people. But one has an insecure, fragile foundation, and the other has the rock. It's interesting here, it does not say a rock. It says the rock. It's mentioned twice, and it's mentioned with the definite article, the rock, the rock. There's not many rocks. There's only one rock, and that rock is Jesus. In both instances, the story points to how one responds to the words of Jesus. The whole image, the whole story points back to the issue of external versus internal righteousness. Remember the Pharisees? They looked great outside. Their, pray their prayers were long and beautiful. They're giving, oh, so much show off. They're fasting, oh, they look terrible. But inside, they were not transformed. And the point here is, outside, we can all look the same. At the end, it's about the foundation. Are we building our lives on ourselves, on our feelings, on our opinions, or are we building our lives on Christ, the solid rock? It is important to observe that the house that was built on the rock will still face rains, floods, and storms. A life built on Christ will have troubles. The same storms that would hit faithful disciples will also hit unfaithful people. Obedience to the words of Jesus would not shield us from storms we will keep us through the storms. It's important for us to understand this. The disciple, the believer, the Christian will suffer. We will face storms, challenges, rain, winds, all of that. The Lord is not promising that he will shield us from trouble, but he will keep us through the trouble. At the end of the storm, the house that was built on Christ will be standing. The other one will not. And of course, the context in this passage here, when he's talking about the storm, he's talking about the final judgment. If we're here last week, he said, on that day, on that day meant the date of judgment. So all these storms that we face, the small ones that are painful, they point toward a greater one, the one storm of God's judgment. Some of us are being pounded head today by the winds and the water of storms like cancer, divorce, 
losing a loved one, unemployment, a son or a daughter that has rebelled against God. And those storms are really painful. They are not fun. They hurt. They are difficult. And, but as difficult as they are, they are nothing compared to the final judgment. Let me make a pastoral parenthesis here. If you're facing some difficult challenges today, some difficult storms, category five hurricanes, and you have trusted in Jesus, take heart. Christ is your rock. He is with you. He will sustain you. He will keep you. In Christ, you are secured. Christ is not only with you, he is in you. Perhaps you will say, I do not know what is coming next. I do not think I will be able to continue to provide for my family. If my son does not change, if my daughter does not change, I don't think I can take it anymore. I don't have more strength to fight for my marriage. I will invite you to find refuge and strength in Christ. I implore you, do not lose heart. Trust the Lord. Trust Jesus. Do not trust your strength or your power, but Jesus' power. We obey his words, but it's his power that keeps us. It's important for us to understand this. It's not our obedience that will sustain us. It is the power of the rock that will sustain us. And some of you were pounded, hit by a storm, and you came down. Perhaps when someone betrayed you, when someone abandoned you, that storm brought you down. But you still have time to find the rock. When this one, the final one comes, then at that point there will not be time. But today we have time to have Christ as our rock and foundation. We know when the storms are coming here. I mean, we know days ahead of time when the hurricanes are coming. Not only days, weeks. We can see the, the uh, tracks in the uh, oceans weeks before they come here. And we get ready. We find shelter. We buy water. We go to the supermarket and buy weeks of food, and then we don't know what to do with it. So because we know that those are coming, this one here, no one knows. Only the Father. So my question to you is, are you ready today to face God? Are you ready to face the storm? Of final judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, And just as he was appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. We don't know when that final storm will come for us. The question is, are you ready? Run to Jesus, find refuge in Christ, build your life on Christ. If you are in Christ, you should be encouraged because you are secured in Christ. 
Not because you are strong. Because Jesus is all powerful. To be wise is to walk in obedience to the word of the Lord. While we are being kept and protected by the power of the word. Trust Jesus. Number three and final one. Jesus is not only a great teacher. He's also God in the flesh. Follow and trust him. Jesus is not only a great teacher. He's also God in the flesh. Follow and trust him. Read with me verses 28 and 29. And when Jesus finished these sayings, so this is now Matthew coming back. So for the last, I don't know, few months, I'll be walking through the Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus speaking. Now Matthew, the commentator, comes back. And he brings the passage to a conclusion. He said, and now, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. And then the end of the sermon. So Matthew is telling us, now he's gone. If you read chapter 8, verse 1, he says, And then he came down from the mountain, and great crowds followed him. So this is the end. But what I want you to see here is that Matthew is highlighting the issue of authority. That Jesus spoke with an authority that no one else had. The people, they were astonished, amazed, impressed with the words of Jesus. Because he spoke with them like no one else. In fact, the issue of authority is introducing the next two chapters. When we will see in chapter 8 that Jesus has authority over diseases, over the leprosy, that Jesus has power over demons, that Jesus has power over nature, that Jesus has powers over death, because he's healing the sick, he's giving freedom to the captive, and he is speaking to the storms, and they obey him, and he's raising the dead. All of those stories are pointing us to the power of Jesus. So Jesus has authority. He is not a mere preacher, teacher. He is God in the flesh. Observe that in the previous verses he said, Everyone then who hears these words of mine... And does them. Verse 26. Everyone who hears these words of mine and, do no, and does not practice them. You see, he says, the wise person is not the one who is listening to the elders or to the Torah. He says, to these words of mine. Jesus is putting his words at the same level as the words of the Old Testament. And he's placing himself in the place of Yahweh. These words of mine. I mean, the end of the sermon is flooded. I mean, it's permeated with first-person pronouns. Think about last week, and I put a graphic here from last week and this week. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that Lord, Lord is the Greek word curious, which is the translation of the name Yahweh in the Old Testament. So he said, everyone who says to me, he says, 
Not everyone who says to God. Jesus says, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, who doesn't, and they say, the will of my Father. And they say, on that day, the day of judgment, many will say to me. So when Jesus says to me, he's the one sitting on judgment, on judging. He is the one on the throne. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and the X in your name and X in your name? We did all of this. So I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. And then he says here, everyone then who hears these words of mine, these words of mine. So Jesus is the Lord, God in the flesh. He is the rock. Jesus is not only placing himself at the level of the Bible. He's placing himself as the one who spoke in the Bible. And this is important for us to understand. There's a movement in the last decades. I mean, it goes back to the 17th century. That something today we call red letter Christianity which basically looks for the red letters in the Bible that are the words of Jesus and elevate the words of Jesus against the rest of the Bible, that is a false teaching because the whole Bible is the word of Jesus. When Matthew speaks, Matthew speaking in power, anointed by the Holy Spirit, that's why the, Old, the New Testament says, and like in the book of Acts or in the book of Hebrews, well, as the Holy Spirit said, and they quoting David, because when David spoke, he was speaking inspired by God. Jesus himself said, Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets, they spoke of me. There's a passage, I think, is in John 10. When the Pharisees come, they come to Jesus and they say, and he says, and they wanted to stone him, to kill him. And then he said, who are you who make yourself equal with God? He said, how can you, and the language they use in the Bible is, how can you, being a man, make yourself one with God? The question they should be asking is, how you, being God, became man? Because it was God, the eternal Son of God, who became flesh and dwelt among us. And the one speaking here is the very one who created us. So we see in verse 28, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished. It's interesting. Matthew is making a distinction between the crowds and the disciples. The crowds, the multitude, they are listening to Jesus. They are impressed with Jesus, but they are not doing the words of Jesus. Even here, this morning, most of us in this room are disciples. But here, in our midst, and I'm thankful that you're here, you are part of the crowd. Because you're just listening to Jesus but not doing, practicing the words of Jesus. You are not trusting in Jesus. You are not putting your faith in Jesus. You are not building your life on Jesus. He is not your rock. But he says this so that you will realize that you are not, so that you will trust him and believe him. And if you believe him, he will receive you. If you confess him, he will save you. So this passage is here 
Because the Lord wants you to hear this passage so that you believe in Jesus and trust Jesus and be saved in Jesus. The Bible teaches that we all have sinned. That we all deserved the punishment from God because God is just and holy, perfect, and we are not. But in his mercy and his goodness and grace and sweetness and beauty, he sent his son, Jesus, to live, to die, to be buried, and to be resurrected for us. To pay the penalty, to receive the punishment that we deserve. And God raised him from the dead, accepting his sacrifice as a substitute for anyone who would trust in him. So this passage is inviting us to build our life on Christ, to trust him, to put our faith in him. Look at the response of the cross. I feel like it's so common. They are impressed, so superficial. It's only skin deep. They are amazed, but not transformed. You can be Im impressed, encouraged, and yet not saved. I mean, you cannot blame them by being amazed, astonished at the teaching of Jesus. But it's a grave crime, a great tragedy to be astonished and nothing more. I cannot imagine greater tragedy than for someone to listen to the words of Jesus, to meet Jesus, to walk with Jesus, and walk away amazed, but still unchanged. So my appeal to you, do not walk away unchanged. Trust Jesus. Do not say or even think that you cannot come because you are not ready. You will never be. He is inviting you to come to him as you are, to trust him, and he will save you. When God speaks, we listen. And he has spoken. Follow and obey Jesus. He's not just a great teacher. He is God in the flesh who came to redeem us, to save us, to transform us. In a moment, we will sing and pray. And pastors will be here in the front. If you have questions about what it means to follow Jesus, I invite you, come, talk with one of us, and we would love to explain to you. But it's very simple. Cry out to him. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you cry out to Jesus, you don't have to cry out loudly. Right now, say, Jesus, save me. Save me from my sins. I know that I a sinner, and I know that only you can save me because you lived, died, and were resurrected for me. He will save you. And we would love to talk with you about that. Brothers and sisters, as disciples of Christ, let us be doers of the words. I think it's an awful witness for the gospel for us to pontificate on teaching and great speeches and many Bible studies when we are not walking differently from the world. 
Let us be doers of the word, not only hearers of the word. I pray that we'll be transformed. And as we grow in love for Christ, we will be more like Christ. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Please stand as we pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be doers of the word. Not only as students of the word, but practitioners of the word. Not only announcers of the word, but those who live the word. Help us to love the word, to walk the word, to practice the word, to be like Christ. Help us to be faithful to you, to love you, to love others, to love the word, to follow Christ, to practice his teaching, to show the mercy the peacemaking, the humility of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. And I pray for those who are here who do not know you, for that person who is here, who's struggling, who's even trying not to listen to the word. I pray that that person, you will bring that person to yourself, that you will draw that person to yourself and he will trust you today, that she will trust you today. It is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.